Let us begin by asking a question. What would have happened to a child of uh, 170 IQ born into a Paleolithic family at the time of, say, the cave paintings of Lascaux? Well, uh, quite obviously, I mean, even if he was as intelligent as Professor Wiener, he could have hardly developed cybernetics at that period. Uh, uh, he could have been nothing except a, a hunter and a food gatherer. There was no other opportunity for him to be anything else. And now the interesting fact is, of course, that the biologists assure us that um, physiologically, uh, anatomically, we are very much the same as we were 20,000 years ago and that we are using fundamentally the same equipment as the Aurignacian man uh, to uh, produce incredibly different results. That we have in the course of these 20,000 years uh, actualized an immense number of things which at that time and for many, many centuries thereafter were wholly potential and latent in man. And this, I think, gives us reason for uh, tempered optimism in regard to the future. I think there are still a great many potentialities of a desirable kind, of course also of an undesirable kind, but I think there are still great potentialities for rationality, for affection and kindliness, for creativity, uh, still lying latent in man. And it may be, since everything has speeded up so enormously in recent years, it may be that we shall find methods for going almost as far beyond the point where we have reached now. Uh, we may find methods for going beyond it within a few hundred years uh, to go beyond it as far as we have succeeded in going beyond our Ignatian ancestors uh, in 20,000 years. I, I think this is not an entirely... A fantastic belief. Uh, the uh, neurologists assure us that uh, nobody, no human being has ever made use of more than perhaps as much as 10% of all the neurons in his brain. And perhaps uh, if we set about it in the right way, we may be able to produce extraordinary uh, things out of this strange piece of work that a man is. Well, uh, there are, of course, geneticists who talk about the possibilities of, uh, of eugenics, and that quite clearly it would be possible to, to breed a more efficient type of man. But I think this is so far out of any uh, question of practical politics at the moment that it's not worth discussing. And, and also, we, uh, at present, we really don't know what to breed for. We... we or the, the most that we can say is that there are certain undesirable things which we would like to breed against, but when it comes to the positive side, we don't, I think, know enough to be uh, practical geneticists yet. So I won't uh, talk about that at all, but consider what can be done with the kind of human beings that we are at present. Now, I would think that one of the most important things we have to think about uh, in relation uh, to human beings and to the possibility of actualizing more of our desirable potentialities, one of the important uh, points which we should stress, I feel, more than we do now is the fact of human differences. Now, uh, human differences are in their way just as important as human similarities. Uh, human beings are unique. We, the, the species is more variable than any other species. And every type of human being, every individual who can be, of course, he can be categorized as a continuous, in a system of continuous variables within a three-pole system, every individual has a right to his own place in the system and a right to develop according to his own constitution and temperament. And I, I think that, uh, that this, we shall find increasingly, is a matter of, of very great importance in getting the best out of human beings. 
Uh, that is to say, uh, recognizing the fact of their intrinsic difference and trying in each case to work out means by which they can, every individual can be helped to actualize his potentialities in his particular place uh, in the general scheme of human beings. And now, of course, this fact has been recognized from time immemorial that uh, no, no single one ideal uh, is suitable for all human beings. After all, within the Christian tradition, we have the two ideals of the way of Martha and the way of Mary, the way of action and the way of contemplation. <coughs> and within the Oriental framework, we have, a, I think, a rather more realistic division of uh, human beings, uh, where there, there are three main ideals. In the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna says that there are three ways of coming to uh, enlightenment, to salvation. There is the way of bhakti, the way of, uh, of devotion, there's the way of karma yoga, the way of, of selfless action, and there is the way of jnana yoga, the way of contemplation. And these three polar extremes correspond very closely, I think, to some of the mo most recent uh, uh, ideas about the categorizing of human beings. They correspond to the French idea which was... Uh, popular in the earlier half of the 19th century of the, the three types, what was called the digestive type, the muscular type, the cerebral type, and uh, correspond closely to the idea of the three poles of possible viable human variability which uh, Sheldon has outlined, the, uh, the um, endomorph, mesomorph, and ectomorph. Uh, and I think it, <clears throat> we shall find that probably, in due course, it will be found valuable to develop types of differential education for children, of, uh, uh, certainly for those uh, at the extreme limits uh, of these uh, polar distinctions. Uh, we, after all, now have seen the value of differential education in regard to the, uh, both to the intellectually uh, highly gifted and to the intellectually undergifted. But I think we shall find it valuable to ha have differential education not merely, so to say, on the vertical level, but also on the horizontal level. That it will be useful to take children according to the, their uh, nature of their temperament and give them slightly different kinds of training. One of the valuable things I think will be to uh, to so to say, temper the wind to the shorn lamb, above all, <coughs> to not to plunge the extreme, linear, thin, sensitive, introverted child into the midst of uh, husky, uh, extroverted uh, mesomorphs, which causes a great deal of, of suffering on the part of the child. And there are, of course, uh, I mean, we live uh, in a world where People like Freud have said that, uh, extra, uh, that, uh, that extroversion is the way of health for everybody. Well, this is obviously simply not true, that uh, it happened to be true for Freud, who was a, an extremely driving kind of, of um, extrovert. But it is not true for very many people. And in fact, we see throughout civilization, uh, various histories of civilization, that Extremely ingenious devices have been made, A, for protecting the, the introvert from, too violent, from his too violent fellows, and also for finding means for providing safety valves and outlets for the violent people, aggressive people, without uh, their doing too much harm to other people. After all, the whole monastic system was in a sense a device for saving the valuable introverted people from too much contact with the uh, feudal classes and devices like the Teutonic Knights and the Templars were methods for canalizing these tremendous aggressive energies of, the, uh, of, the, of these types of people into ways which though they might be harmful for infidels 
were not harmful for the, their own societies. And these were, <coughs> well, these were very ingenious devices, which I think we can certainly profitably imitate in our own way. Now, before I go on to the problems of, of education, uh, I would like to talk about um, some ways of um, developing, uh, of actualizing desirable potentialities, which may have nothing to do with education at all. Uh, these are the ways which uh, are essentially chemical and pharmacological. Uh, two or three years ago, it was announced that the uh, Russian Academy of Sciences was engaged uh, on a five-year plan to try to improve um, intellectual efficiency by pharmacological means. Now, th this sounds a little fantastic, but I have talked to pharmacologists about this matter, and uh, a number of them say this is probably quite possible, that it may be possible to, <coughs> by pharmacological means, which will do uh, no harm to the organism as a whole, to increase the span of attention to increase the powers of, of concentration, uh, perhaps to cut down on the necessity for sleep, and various other things, which, uh, which may lead to a very considerable um, increase in uh, general uh, mental efficiency. Uh, uh, seeing the extraordinary rate at which pharmacology is advancing at the present time, I would not be at all surprised if within the next 10 or 20 years something of this kind did become possible and that it, it, may, it may be uh, conceivable that uh, people will be made mentally more efficient by pharmacological means. But then there is another possibility, uh, which is this, that uh, somebody may discover a really good euphoric, something which will make people feel happy without... Uh, damaging the, their physical organism. Well, psychologically, we know what the two best conditions for uh, effective accomplishment are. The most favorable condition is crisis. People in crisis will do the most extraordinary things, uh, but you can't keep up crisis. So the, uh, the whole <laughs> essence of crisis is it lasts for a very short time. If it lasts for too long, then it becomes excessive strain and people break down under it. But the other, uh, the other condition under which people uh, function at a very high level in general is a condition of happiness. People who are contented and, and happy, uh, I think that it very frequently happens, I think, that these, this mood of happiness, so to say, lowers the barrier between the conscious and the pre-conscious self, between the, the ego and the creative powers, and permits the person to do more and better than he would have uh, uh, if he had not been happy. And also, <coughs> uh, there are other points here. Uh, I mean, I think that it, we may find that uh, if we have a good and completely harmless euphoric, but actually people may be more moral. Uh, Bertrand Russell has pointed out frequently that, that uh, contented and happy people are generally much more virtuous and kindly than unhappy people. And that uh, here again we may see uh, in an indirect way this, um, the pharmacological advances contributing to uh, the realization, the actualization of um, desirable potentialities. Well, now let's come to the <coughs> problem of education. Here, of course, I mean, the, the thing which, of course, is a burning question here at MIT and, of course, at many other uh, places of higher learning is the problem of um, scientific specialization and what is to be done about it. But we cannot, quite obviously, we cannot escape from uh, specialization. And the problem is, how is it to be offset and mitigated? How are the undesirable effects of extreme specialization to be avoided? Well, the, um, 
answer up to the present, of course, has been that it should be, that the scientific specialization uh, should be mitigated by courses in the humanities. And this is very good. It is excellent that there should be courses in the humanities. But when we examine the matter a little more closely, we find that, after all, courses in the humanities are courses in the world of symbols, of language. That so that to, uh, a man, as I've kept on repeating in these lectures, is an amphibious creature, and uh, among the worlds in which he lives, the d disparate worlds which he inhabits, are the worlds of immediate experience, more or less immediate, and uh, the worlds of symbols and language. Now, uh, both these worlds, of the scientific world and the uh, world of the humanities, are both sim worlds of symbols and language. Uh, so that a specialization in one type of symbols is being offset by a specialization in another type of symbols. So that <clears throat> I think we find here uh, that uh, this is finally not very satisfactory, that what we need, perhaps, is uh, some kind of mitigation of all this symbolic uh, specialization in symbolic subject matter by some kind of direct training of the mind-body which has to use the symbols and do the living and form concepts and, and thoughts. And uh, the, this, it seems to me, uh, is one of the, the major problems which confronts us. How are we to find a, a method of teaching people, so to say, the non-verbal humanities uh, in some way to counteract the excessive specialization on, uh, the, in the, on the level of symbols, both in science and in the conventional uh, liberal arts courses. And incidentally, it's interesting to, to reflect that uh, the, uh, the liberal arts of the medieval curriculum were all, with the exception of astronomy and music, were all verbal arts. They were all concerned with words, and even music was treated as a science rather than as a as a uh, uh, as a pleasure and a, a, and a, an emotional appreciation. And of course, astronomy was was also highly abstract and moralistic. So that almost the entire curriculum in uh, medieval times was it was fully devoted to the uh, to uh, to a verbal training. Uh, on the level of symbols. And we still inherit this. I mean, we are, I think, a good deal better than the medieval people were in regard to training outside the world of symbols, but we haven't, it seems to me, yet gone far enough in this direction. And here I would, um, would like to quote again uh, something which I quoted before. This is a remarkable phrase of... Um, of uh, Spinoza's, where he says, uh, uh, teach the body to become capable of many things. In this way, you will perfect the mind and permit it to come to the intellectual love of God. But this is, I, I, the more one reflects on this phrase, the more remarkable it is. And uh, this, I would say, it would be the kind of, uh, of slogan, so to say, the kind of first axiomatic statement of what this, uh, this type of non-verbal education should be. Well, now let's consider <coughs> the ways in which we could apply this kind of non-verbal humanistic education uh, to uh, human beings. First of all, we would start, I suppose, with, uh, with perception, which is completely ba basic to all uh, uh, intellectual life. I mean, I think all good thinking, good feeling, good willing, uh, are finally dependent upon good perception. And we do remarkably little, I think, in the way of, uh, uh, of training uh, the perceptions. 
uh, we do something in the realm of music, we do quite a lot in the realm of music. We don't do very much in regard to the other special senses. Uh, and we don't do very much, I think, in the realm of seeing, which is probably uh, is the, uh, the most important um, area of perception, the one which we make use of the most. And uh, there is uh, plenty of work which has been done which indicates that uh, a proper uh, training in the perceptions, a training above all in seeing, uh, can be of great value uh, to people. <coughs> uh, it uh, can be used to, um, to help the human being in all kinds of ways, to, to make the, the body more capable of many things. And, and let me, I would like to make a short digression, because I've forgotten a point here which I think is important to make, that this, um, this type of special uh, training of the non-verbal humanities, the training of the mind-body, is probably particularly important at this time when advancing technology has made a great many of the skillful uses of correlated hand, mind, and eye unnecessary. Uh, if you look at the what used to be called masterworks, which were the works uh, masterpieces. A masterpiece was a, a piece of work done by an apprentice to prove that he had learned everything that uh, was to be known about his trade and was fit to become himself a master. Well, the interesting thing about all these, uh, uh, these uh, special skills was that extremely primitive and simple tools were used with immensely skillful hands and eyes and minds to produce very complicated results. Today we have excessively complicated tools which can produce even more extraordinary results, but with a minimum of, uh, of hand-eye-mind correlation and often with no hand-mind and eye at all if the, if the machine is completely automatic and foolproof. And this word foolproof is very important because a foolproof machine or a foolproof organization, it is not only foolproof, it is also spontaneity proof. It is also inspiration proof. It is also virtuoso proof. Uh, so that uh, I, this means, I think, that we are now more than ever in need of this special kind of, of training the body to have these... Uh, non-verbal skills because there are so many areas of our life where this is not imposed upon us by the structure of our society and the nature of our technology uh, that, that we must do consciously what was done to a very large extent unconsciously in the past but, well now to get back to this, uh, this question uh, of, of training the perceptions now uh, quite a lot of work as I say, has been done in this field. I, I know only a little of it, but I've been very struck, for example, by the work which is, was done at the University of Ohio by Professor Samuel Renshaw uh, in the training of, uh, of all the special senses, above all of vision, and uh, by another man at the University of Ohio, Professor Hoyt Sherman, who employed Renshaw's methods in relation to the teaching of art with the very greatest success. And here are two extremely valuable techniques. I can't go into the details of them now, but they have been fully developed. And one of the interesting things uh, seems to be uh, the when these techniques uh, were applied to elementary schools, it was found that the, the children who underwent this kind of training of the visual sense uh, were developed uh, more rapidly. They, they seemed to be more intelligent. They, they, uh, the, their scholastic performance was better. They were more interested in what they were doing. They, um, and therefore they behaved better. So that uh, there was a great advantages on every level seemed to accrue from uh, this type of training. 
And as I say, uh, a lot of work in these uh, fields has been done, and I think there's a, a very good case for looking into this and seeing what more can be done. Now, of course, the training of the perceptions is only a special aspect of the general training in awareness. Now, I would regard awareness as one of the, the so to say, the absolute values of, of human life. I, I think it's a, it is an absolute good to increase awareness. Um, this is an act of faith, but I, I think that uh, awareness ranks with uh, kindliness and intelligence as uh, as one of the uh, as one of the basic goods which we should try to realize and of course from time immemorial uh, philosophers have been saying know thyself gnoskite ipsum but it, it is of course very characteristic of our strange civilization that philosophic and moral precepts are given like know thyself and, and the ideal of self knowledge but no means whereby these, this ideal can be implemented or the precept obeyed. No means are offered. And um, it is for this reason of extreme importance that we examine the means. I mean, we, we're, we're full of high ideals and full of noble precepts, but we're extremely short of methods whereby we can fulfill these ideals and obey the precepts. And this is why uh, recent advances uh, in this field seem to me to be particularly welcome. Now, I have been greatly impressed recently by uh, a book which uh, published nearly ten years ago uh, by Pearls, Hefferlein and Goodman called Gestalt Therapy, which is, uh, among other things, a huge compendium of means by which uh, awareness can be heightened and extended in every direction. Uh, the uh, therapeutic value of this is quite clear. Uh, what is, is uh, the attempt is being made not to dredge up materials out of the past, but to get people to live in the present. Uh, neurosis, after all, in one of its aspects, can really be defined as a person reacting to present challenges in terms of reactions which were appropriate at some time in the past when he had some traumatic or other experience, but which are wholly inappropriate now. And the standard uh, therapeutic method, of course, is to dig up these uh, events out of the past and try to abreact them and get the person to understand them. But an equally good and probably rather better method is to get people here and now to live in the present. And this is precisely what the Gestalt therapists are trying to do. They propose any number of, uh, of very interesting exercises for increasing the people's awareness of the here and now, of events outside themselves, events going on within their bodies, the, the nature of their fantasies, their wills, and so on. Now, this, of course, is, is by no means an entirely new discovery. It's, it's interesting to note that to one of the most successful therapists, a man with a European reputation while he was working, he died in 1925, was the, the Swiss psychotherapist, Dr. Vitos, whose methods were essentially the same as those of the... Of the um, Gestalt therapists. He uh, treated neuroses and he treated them by all accounts even more successfully than the uh, majority of his fellows using these other dredging in the past methods simply by getting people to be aware of what was going on outside them, what was going on within themselves, of being aware of such a simple act as raising the hand, for example, being aware of uh, of external things in a completely receptive way with a minimum of imposition of ideas upon them but to uh, he, what he encouraged above all in the matter of perception was this matter of pure receptivity and he did this not merely as a therapeutic method but he did it also as a way for increasing the enjoyment of life for teaching people to live better and more satisfactorily. 
And he summed up his, uh, his philosophy in these words. When you have learned to become more receptive, you will have a greater enjoyment of life and everything will interest you more. Now here, let me repeat this thing which I've mentioned before about happiness. I would say that enjoyment is, is, a, is a categorical imperative in this sense that, that um, if we can be interested in things and enjoy them, we shall be freed from many of the temptations for, of delinquency. Here again, uh, uh, Russell has uh, underlined the fact that this chronic boredom in which so many people live uh, certainly encourages to uh, small-scale delinquency and probably also even encourages the fact that people still tolerate the, the idea of war because war is so exciting that, they, that it's an immense relief from the boredom of ordinary life. And, of course, it is an extraordinary and, uh, I think, a very appalling fact that uh, the suicide rate regularly falls in wartime, that uh, it takes a war <laughs> to make life sufficiently interesting for people not to kill themselves. And this happens even in neutral countries which are not at war. I mean, people are so interested to see what tomorrow's paper will contain <laughs> that they delay the, or put off completely the, their ideas of suicide. And it's a, it's a terrible thing that it requires a, a war to make life seem worthwhile and meaningful to immense numbers of people who, to, for whom the ordinary humdrum life of peace seems unutterably boring uh, and who therefore require some kind of, of delinquency to liven things up. And uh, I think Vito's is probably right that... Uh, if one has been trained uh, to become intensely aware receptively of the, of the world and of what is going on, life becomes extremely interesting and that many things which seem very dull are seem to be, seem to be exciting and beautiful. And uh, this, uh, uh, this I do think is a very important point. Well, we, there, of course, are other areas in which awareness can be trained. Uh, I mean, I think the, the whole area of imagination is one which we do very little to train now, and it is an area of immense importance. Uh, very valuable work has been done in this field uh, by um, Herbert Reed in his uh, Education Through Art. This is a, a very remarkable book which um, uh, shows the, the, how the, the faculties of imagination can be you, trained in such a way as to foster the creativity of the uh, person who trains them. And in uh, Gestalt therapy, we find uh, many recipes for the training of the imagination. And uh, there are a number of other books that I happen to have read. I'm sure there are many more that I haven't read. Uh, I know an excellent little book, for example, for the training uh, of the imagination of children. It's called Imagination Games uh, by a man called DeMille, uh, which is extremely useful uh, as showing, first of all, how to get children to use their imagination to get more fun out of life, but also what is very, very valuable is to show them how to use their imagination in a preventive and therapeutic way so that they can get out of all kinds of obsessive and painful situations. I mean, for example, a simple device would be in relation to some grown-up of whom they are frightened, where they can use their imagination in such a way that they can make this grown-up in their fancy perform ridiculous acts, climb on trees like monkeys. They, they can multiply them, have 20 of them dancing a jig. Uh, they can finally throw them into the sea in their imagination. And this is a very valuable procedure, which will, <laughs> which will uh, certainly help a great many children to get out of uh, many of their fears. 
And in the same way, in Gestalt therapy, there are many exercises of the imagination designed precisely to decondition oneself, to get out of the obsessive ruts which we tend to have been, uh, have been, which have been pushed into by our education. And uh, this is a, an immensely powerful instrument which, uh, which can be uh, used uh, to uh, help us in innumerable ways. Well, then let me very briefly touch on another, uh, mo another exercise, another technique of awareness, which is a technique which um, John Dewey greatly recommended. It is a technique d devised by the late F.M. Alexander, <coughs> which is a technique of being aware of what, uh, what uh, Alexander called the use of the self, of being aware of the wrong use of the self and of taking lessons in the right use, which, uh, again, is too complicated to describe at length. But uh, Dewey was uh, so convinced of its uh, enormous value that in one of the prefaces that he wrote to Alexander's books, he says that uh, Alexander's technique is to education what education is to life in general. It proposes an ideal and provides means whereby that ideal can be realized. But this is obviously extremely high praise. And yet the extraordinary fact is that although Dewey has had an immense influence on you know, education and the minds of educators in general, nobody has paid the slightest attention to this. And that uh, Alexander remains almost unknown. I'm glad to say there is in this area a tiny oasis of Alexanderism at, at Tufts University, and the, where some quite interesting research, very interesting research, is going on in relation to his work. But it seems very strange that a, a method so highly recommended by the, this man, who after all produced a revolution in education, John Dewey, should have been so totally uh, neglected. Now, Finally, before I leave this subject, uh, let me say that the, I've mentioned the Gestalt therapy and the work of Vitos in our century, but actually, of course, these kind of techniques go back to an enormous distance into the past, above all in the in Oriental literature. One can find, for example, there's an extraordinary tantric text, which I suppose goes back, I don't know, probably to the beginning of our era, uh, where it, uh, the text is introduced by a kind of interview between Shiva and his divine consort, Parvati, the goddess. And the goddess asks him, what is the secret of your kind of uh, enlightened consciousness? And he answers by giving her a list of 118 exercises uh, in consciousness which will help uh, to go forward into this ultimate uh, transforming consciousness. Into, uh, they are exercises in psychology for the purpose of uh, developing the end products of what Kumaraswamy called ontology, the science of the self with the large S, the science of the pure ego, the science of the Atman. And uh, in these exercises, which uh, outline methods for becoming conscious of, of every type of human activity, even down to sneezing and, and eating and going to sleep, uh, he suggests, so he anticipates um, almost everything that vetoes and the Gestalt therapists uh, uh, have done, and it, it provides a sort of complete curriculum, actually, this of, of what can be uh, done in this uh, field for uh, developing the, um, the mind body, for teaching the body, or we should better state the mind body, to become capable of many things, as, uh, as Spinoza put it. Well, now... <coughs> We have to go on to uh, a very important point, which is the, the problem of um, 
actualizing benevolence, actualizing love and kindliness, and if possible, preventing the opposites from being actualized. Uh, this, of course, is one of the major problems which has always confronted every society. How do we encourage love and benevolence, and how do we prevent uh, these impulses to violence and brutality from uh, breaking out and uh, doing their appalling harm. Well, uh, here again, it's interesting to find that uh, whereas uh, every, all the great world religions have inculcated love and kindliness and benevolence, virtually none have provided means whereby uh, these uh, qualities can be actualized, can be built into the child. And it's a very curious fact that it, it has remained for an extremely obscure, very savage tribe in New Guinea, a tribe described by Margaret Mead, to develop an extremely effective method for building an attitude of love into the child during infancy. Margaret Mead describes uh, this, these methods of the Arapesh. The Arapesh, unfortunately, uh, on this side, they were entirely admirable, but they were a bit sloppy otherwise. They, they seemed to lack uh, uh, the ability to do things very well, but I don't think there's any incompatibility between love and, and uh, e efficiency. I think it's by no means <laughs> past the wit of man to combine the two. But the methods which she describes are extremely interesting. The, the infant is held by its mother. Is, while it is being nursed, she talks to it, plays with it, caresses it, and uh, t uh, periodically brings the child into physical contact with, sometimes with other members of the family, other members of the tribe, sometimes with the domestic animals, and always murmuring, as she does so, the word good, good. Well, the child doesn't understand it yet, but of course the tone means something, and when the child learns to speak, uh, this, uh, the uh, significance of the word good will enter its mind. And a real conditioned reflex of an extraordinarily valuable nature will have been built up. And Margaret Mead records how extraordinary it was to discover these uh, children, these Arapesh children, would naturally be alarmed when uh, she came into the hut. I mean, she was of a different color. She was dressed in a wholly different way. She was, came from somewhere right outside the tribe. And for a moment, the child would be very frightened. But then the mother would just say, good, good. And the child would immediately run to... Margaret Mead and let itself be picked up and uh, the general attitude towards the other human beings and towards animals was one of trustful affection and, um, and liking and benevolence and their, their whole uh, pattern of life uh, of the Arapesh was uh, deeply influenced by this, uh, this early training. Well, I, we should certainly not be too proud to learn from people, however primitive they may seem, because this seems to be an extraordinarily brilliant invention. And as heaven knows, we have need enough of love in, the, in the, this extremely loveless world which we live in. Now, the converse, of course, is the problem of how do we deal with the aggressive elements in man, the tendencies towards violence and brutality, which are apt to be very strong. And this is something which has uh, certainly preoccupied people from time immemorial. It is, of course, quite useless to make exhortations and say, be good and so on, unless one offers some means whereby these uh, tendencies can somehow be worked off in a harmless way. Well, here again we can probably learn quite a lot from earlier civilizations, uh, 
the violent uh, dancing of the Greeks, the Dionysiac orgies, undoubtedly all these things helped greatly to, to get rid of a great deal of aggressive uh, uh, tendencies in man. And um, the problem, of course, is a, is a very, a very grave one. Uh, Professor Gordon Allport has, um, has talked about the extreme difficulties of, uh, of getting rid of prejudice. I mean, he's uh, written at great length on this subject, uh, and he's reviewed the various things which have been done, for example, to diminish ethnic prejudice, prejudice against uh, racial groups, and he does come to a rather pessimistic conclusion that uh, very few of these methods are really effective, that uh, probably the only really effective one is some kind of individual therapy. Well, obviously, you can't individually therapize, therapize millions of people. And um, uh, we obviously must find some way in which these kind of... Uh, of uh, violent uh, drives, which evidently give a profound psychological re pleasure to people. I mean, they, uh, these kind of violences pay, so to say, a high psychological dividend. Uh, as Blake said years ago, damn braces, bless relaxes. And people like being braced rather than relaxed. Uh, and there is a, a real satisfaction to be got out of this, I mean, which we understand now quite well what the physiological basis of this is, that there is a release of the adrenaline, which many people find very satisfactory in fairly small quantities. I mean, I think there are many people who are genuine adrenaline addicts. That, uh, <laughs> they fly into a rage and do very violent things because they get a real kick out of it. And we, we have to discover ways by which this kind of uh, desire for having lots of adrenaline can be got rid of. In the past, after all, it was all very simple because we lived in a, an extremely dangerous world, running away from animals, running away from, from other savage men, and we got rid of our adrenaline in that way. But in a world where everybody is virtually sedentary, People are sitting in cars on foam rubber. This um, <laughs> presents a very, very serious problem, and we quite clearly have to discover ways by which this kind of, of physiological product of violence, which is also a cause of all kinds of, of uh, evil tendencies, can be worked off. Now, years ago... Um, William James wrote an essay, which is still very interesting, called The Moral Equivalence of War, where he laid out some ideas for finding some kind of equivalence and which would satisfy people instead of war. But I, his suggestions, I don't think, go nearly far enough. And I think unquestionably we have to work out a great many new uh, devices uh, for getting rid of, uh, of these uh, dangerous and, uh, and disturbing factors in man. Um, as I say, we, I think there are plenty of precedents in earlier civilizations, some among primitive people, some among quite highly civilized people, which we could probably examine and reinterpret in the light of what we now know about the hormones and uh, other physiological uh, aspects of, of the body. And I think it is perfectly possible that we could uh, develop uh, a means whereby a lot of the, what seem to be now quite normal, drives towards violence and uh, cruelty could be uh, got rid of with, uh, uh, without doing much harm to other people. Well... I think I've said enough to show that there, there is a great deal to be done that uh, I've naturally been able to touch only on a few aspects of this enormous subject. 
But I think I've said enough to show that there, there would be a very good case for a systematic examination uh, of these various fields I've touched upon, and no doubt of other fields too, to see where we could find material which would be of value to us in this task of realizing desirable potentialities. I could envisage one of the big um, foundations, for example, setting up a research project. I don't think it would be necessarily very expensive. Um, for Simply for examining what has been found empirically to work in these various fields, they would have to be prepared to look into material which wasn't exclusively scientific. Some of it would seem rather queer and phony and, and primitive. But after all, truth lives at the bottom of a well, and the well is very often muddy. And we mustn't be put off by the mud because the truth may be sitting there. And um, my own feeling is that if this were looked into, uh, if all the empirical findings were found, if the general principles underlying the findings were, were determined, because undoubtedly there are general principles underlying these uh, different uh, methods of, of helping people to realize their potentialities. And then if uh, systems could be worked out experimentally whereby uh, these findings could be applied on every level of education from the kindergarten uh, upwards to the grave, uh, 